Okay, I'm just going to wait another few seconds to give everybody a chance to get in and get their microphones on uh, before we start, because we've got a good crowd today. Okay, I think we can get started. Um, I want to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Miles Rappaport. I am the Senior Practice Fellow in American Democracy here at the Ash Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. I want to thank everybody for joining us and start with just a few announcements on behalf of the Ash Center. Uh, first, I want to recognize that the land on which Harvard University sits uh, was traditionally the land of the Massachusetts people uh, and has always been a place where uh, meetings of nations and in interchange between nations took place. Uh, today's event also is this one of a series of events the Ash Center will be presenting on election issues and democracy issues at a moment when these uh, discussions, these issues are front and center in American political discussion. Uh, today's event, by the way, I want to let everybody know is being recorded. It will be up on the Ash YouTube channel. Um, and so, um, just wanted everybody to make sure that we knew that. Our format for today is conversational. We're not gonna have long speeches to, by the panelists. I'm gonna ask each of them a couple of questions. Uh, and then after that, we will go to the audience and have questions. And my colleague, Tova Wang, who you see here, uh, is gonna be the chief uh, uh, questioner, uh, both looking at your questions, which you should put not in the chat, by the way, put them in the Q&A for the YouTube. I think that will make it easier. Uh, and she, at the when we get there, will uh, look at the questions and make sure that we get the, the groupings of the best questions that we have. All right, let me just frame the issue uh, a little bit more for everybody. Um, today's discussion, I think, is both really important and extremely timely. Uh, the election of 2020 was remarkable for a number of things, as we all know, but one of them was the drama that played out over the election process itself. The starting point was the challenge of doing a major high interest election in the middle of a pandemic. Almost immediately, discussions began to be held about how to open up and accommodate voters safely in the pandemic, uh, by, mainly by expanding voting by mail and expanding early voting possibilities. Equally quickly, the lines of debate fell into very familiar patterns. 2020 elections had the most controversy, the most lawsuits and the most changes in voting process in the middle of the election of any election ever. And throughout all of that, or despite all of that, it had the highest turnout ever in an American election. In the end, according to recent figures released by the Pew Research Center, 158.4 million Americans voted, which is 66.2 of the eligible electorate. Now, here we are in the middle of February of 2021, the state legislatures around the country are in session and the questions of how states are gonna run future elections is at the center of debate again. According to the Brennan Center, at least as of a few days ago, and it changes minute by minute, 165 bills have been filed in 33 states to restrict the vote in some way. And on the other hand, 541 bills have been filed in 37 states to expand voting options, often by making permanent the adjustments that were made last year. As a former state legislator, I know that filing bills is a far cry from getting them passed. Um, but, it's, but the sheer volume of bills is a clear indication that voting is gonna be a major issue in state legislatures this year and will be for the future. So what do we make of all this? What's happening now? What states are the most egregious in one direction or another? And where are we likely to land? Fortunately for us, we have three people who are at the center of these discussions and extremely knowledgeable about them to help us sort this out. Let me introduce them now. Uh, first will be Wendy Underhill. She's the Director of Redistricting and Elections at the National Conference of State Legislatures, known as NCSL. Uh, it is known, it monitors, the NCSL monitors all legislation on all issues, but certainly including election issues. And Wendy is just an incredible bipartisan and authoritative resource on the subject. Personally, I've had the pleasure of working with Wendy at NCSL conferences and events. She's truly a remarkable resource on just the questions we're electing, uh, addressing today. 
And of course, this being the year of the census and redistricting, she's become an expert on all things census as well. Wendy, thank you very much for being here with us. Glad to be here with you, thank you. Dale Ho is a remarkable litigator and is the director of the Voting Rights Project at the American Civil Liberties Union. As such, he has been on the front lines of identifying efforts at voter suppression in states and fighting it back against them in court after court uh, around the country. Dale has argued, personally has argued two cases before the United States Supreme Court on the census and on immigration and has been involved in numerous court cases in states around the country in defense of voting rights. Dale, delighted to have you with us. Thank you so much for Finally. having me. Looking forward to today. Okay, great. Uh, finally, State Senator Nan Grogan Orock of Georgia. Nan began her career as a civil rights activist in SNCC and the Southern Student Organizing Committee and has been in the Georgia State Legislature for over 30 years. She represents a good part of the city of Atlanta uh, and has been a stalwart fighter, often against great odds and opposition on behalf of voting rights and on behalf of full participation for everyone in Georgia. Personally, I'm delighted to say that Nan has been a friend of mine for years and she's on the front lines with Stacey Abrams and others in bringing about real change for the state of Georgia. So with all that as introduction, let me ask my first question to Wendy. Wendy, in your role as a tracker and trend observer in chief, we might say, for state legislation, how would you describe the trends you're seeing in the state legislatures around the country, still at this relatively early point in most of the sessions? Uh, well, thank you, Miles, for inviting me here. And thank you for that very nice introduction. I hope I can live up to what you had to say about me. We'll see. And thanks to everybody who's here with us today. I understand we're landing on Mars at this very moment. So you do have some competition in how you spend your day. Um, so uh, your question is about the trends that we're seeing this year. And uh, it's not surprising that what happened last year in election would drive legislation in the, the following year. That's always the case. And the big news is, of course, related to absentee voting. And I'll, I'll talk about that for a moment. But there was more going on last year than just the huge increase in absentee voting uh, that also is showing up this year. Um, so I'm going to have things in a couple of buckets. We'll do the absentee voting, um, what, what was there, and then a few things from a separate bucket. So just like you said with Brennan, when NCSL looks at the laws that have been, uh, the bills that have been introduced, we see a kind of a parallel uh, set. Uh, some are um, likely to increase the um, access to an absentee or a mail ballot. Some are intended to limit. And I'm gonna say that most of them are fine tuning. Uh, Brennan category categorizes more in those first two buckets of increasing or limiting. We think more fit into that fine tuning category. I think um, the reality is right there out for, for folks to see. And it's not a surprise that primarily Democrats are um, proposing bills that would um, uh, reduce the number of signatures that you need to get an absentee ballot or um, make it easier in one way or another. And it's not a surprise that Republicans throughout the nation are more likely to say what happened last year was a one-off. We wanna to try to um, uh, corral this in some way and, and um, maybe define it and maybe limit it. But the fine tuning pieces, those could work for anybody. And these are things like drop boxes. There, prior to last year, there were only eight states that had legislation that defined a drop box in any way, shape or form. Well, now there's quite a number of states, I think it's about a dozen that have legislation that would identify what's a drop box, how secure does it need to be, and where should it be? It was just a question that wasn't present for us until so many people were voting absentee. Um, ballot collection is kind of a variation on that theme. Who can handle a ballot other than the voter? Um, and so what we've seen some bills that would uh, probably identify exactly who can take that. Is it a family member only? Is it anybody that you'd like? Is there a limit on the number of ballots that could be handled? And then uh, signature verification and signature cure. This is again, if you were in a state where you didn't have very much absentee voting in the past before 2020, you might not have had very clear rules about what signature verification meant or whether the voter could have an opportunity to cure a signature. All of a sudden you saw those states with more absentee voting and now they're saying, let's figure out what that means. So then my second bucket was the things that aren't exactly related to that. And one is primaries. And um, we kind of forget that there were a whole lot of primaries last year, as well as that general election. It seems like so far back. But now uh, the question in front of uh, folks is, uh, how do they want to handle their primaries? And particularly, there seems to be a little trend towards how can unaffiliated voters participate in a primary? 
I, I, obviously, if the primaries are closed, Democrats go here, Republicans go here, and the third of voters who are neither say, what am I, chopped liver? Uh, so I think we're seeing some bills that relate to unaffiliated and whether they can participate. Uh, poll watchers, um, uh, clearly after the election, that became uh, a hot issue. And states have generally had legislation or um, regulation on who can watch at the polls, but there hasn't necessarily been clear legislation on who can watch the voting, the, the counting process. So uh, we're going to see a little bit, since we now have like this whole time frame that's called an election instead of one day, uh, I think the um, regulations around poll watchers is likely to shift a little bit. Um, and of course, the Electoral College, um, uh, every presidential year, you see some bills afterwards either join or exit the national popular vote. This year, we do see more bills related to the congressional district system for allocating electoral votes. And Nebraska, which is one of the two states that currently has that system where they um, give two of their um, uh, electoral college votes to uh, whoever won the state as a whole, and then the others are divvied up by congressional districts. They're looking to shift back perhaps. And then we have a couple of states, Wisconsin's one, and I think Michigan might be the other, where they might go the other direction. So not a surprise, the electoral college brings up a lot of stuff, also faithless electors as well. And I'll just mention briefly, ranked choice voting seems to be, um, if not hot, at least warm. And uh, post-election audits, which is kind of part of the verification system, seems to be something that states are going to be looking at more and more and more. And I think, Miles, I'll hand it back to you with that. I'm happy to come back later and say some more stuff as needed. Great. <clears throat> Wendy, thanks very, very much. Uh, and Dale, let me come to you. You are also one of the keenest watchers in the country of states attempting to restrict voting options, especially in battleground states. Seems like every day we see another story about legislators, usually Republicans, as a matter of accuracy, filing broadside attacks against voting in states like Pennsylvania, Arizona, Iowa, and of course, Georgia, which we'll come back to. Um, what are you seeing and what's the ACLU doing in response? Uh, broadly speaking, and thank you for the kind introduction, Miles, and thank you everyone for um, deciding to spend some of your afternoon um, with this um, panel. It's, uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, broadly speaking, what we're seeing is uh, a, a range of efforts to try to restrict uh, voting, particularly um, voting by mail. And in many ways, what I'm you know, interpreting this as is a kind of recapitulation of um, efforts that we saw to restrict voting after the historic 2008 presidential election. And in particular, um, efforts to restrict um, early voting, um, which was disproportionately used by voters of color in 2008. So let me back up and just try to set this parallel. Um, the 2008 election saw extremely high levels of turnout. Um, it saw um, uh, uh, record levels of participation at that point by um, voters of color. It was the first presidential election nationally in which um, uh, Americans of color were over a quarter of the eligible electorate. Um, we saw huge levels of turnout, um, carried um, Barack Obama, the nation's first black president, um, to victory. Um, and then after that, we saw furious efforts to restrict access to voting and not across the board, not in ways that would have hit all segments of the electorate equally, but um, which seemed surgically targeted at the means of participation that were used disproportionately by those demographic segments of the electorate that had emerged in 2008. And early in-person voting was a key target after the 2008 presidential election. Um, we saw in uh, the early 2010s um, cutbacks on early voting in states like Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Ohio, Wisconsin. Um, the ACLU where I work was involved in litigation um, in a number of those states. And what I think is really interesting is that all of these states were very eager to expand early in-person voting um, 10 years earlier in the early 2000s. Um, that was a period of time in which early in-person voting was disproportionately used by um, white voters. Um, 2008 flipped the script. Um, the Obama campaign was very successful in mobilizing its base um, to turn out to vote early um, and to do so in person. And in a number of these states, um, it was the first election in which um, voters of color and black voters in particular 
um, disproportionately used early in-person voting. Florida, I think, is the most notable example. 2008 was the first presidential election in which Black voters were more likely to use early in-person voting um, than white voters um, in Florida. Um, over half of Black voters in the 2008 presidential election voted early in person as compared to, I think, about 26 percent of white voters. Um, and after that, the Florida legislature responded by cutting five days of early voting and most notoriously eliminating early in-person voting on Sunday before election day, which was a time that was um, um, very significant for um, black churches for schools to the polls activities. Black voters about 20% of the electorate in Florida, but were about 30% of um, early in-person voters on Sunday. Um, so after we saw a change in the demographics of vote, cho vote method choice in the 2008 election, with a shift um, uh, uh, with voters of color and black voters in particular moving towards early in-person voting, we suddenly saw efforts to restrict that means of voting. Um, we're seeing a similar, we're seeing similar beats in the post 2020 um, election story. Um, as Miles noted, um, 2020 had the highest presidential election turnout in terms of sheer number of voters in American history. I think in terms of turnout rate, it was the highest um, since the 1900 presidential election, so more than a century. Um, and we saw, of course, more absentee voting um, than ever, I think primarily due to the pandemic, but also because a number of states had loosened their rules on um, um, voting by mail. A number of states were administering no excuse absentee voting for the first time in a presidential election, including some important battleground states like Michigan um, and Pennsylvania. Now, before 2020, we didn't see many attempts to restrict voting by mail. If anything, we saw kind of a bipartisan consensus around making voting by mail easier. More and more states were offering um, 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 no excuse um, absentee voting. It had passed most recently in Pennsylvania where a, Pen where a um, Republican majority legislature had enacted um, a bill um, um, passing no excuse. Um, in states that enacted strict voter identification requirements, something that's been um, quite controversial, a number of states um, actually exempted absentee voting um, from uh, voter ID requirements, states like North Carolina and Georgia. So we had kind of a broad bipartisan consensus on making voting by mail easier. The one exception to that, I would say, was is in the area of um, ballot collection assistance efforts, which sometimes referred to pejoratively as ballot harvesting. There have been some efforts to put limits on that. But for the most part, um, eligibility to vote by mail, um, and the ease with which people could vote by mail, um, um, those were things where access was expanding over the um, preceding um, decades. Now, historically speaking, I think most political scientists think that no excuse absentee voting hasn't helped one party more than another, but I do think that the demographic data bears, out, bears this out, that white voters usually were more likely to vote by mail um, than voters of color. But like with early in-person voting in the 2008 election, the 2020 presidential election flipped the demographic script. If you look at early analyses, they suggest that there was significantly um, higher rates of voting by mail by voters of color and um, black voters, um, more so at least um, in previous elections, but um, higher rates um, 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 when you compare it to um, white voters. and. Um, now, all of a sudden, in the wake of that, we see restrictions being proposed in states around the country um, to limit access to voting by mail. We see Iowa considering legislation to reduce the period in which people can request absentee votes and to ban elections officials from sending out absentee ballot requests affirmatively to registered voters, something that the Iowa Secretary of State, to his credit, did for all um, registered voters in advance of both the primary and general elections in um, 2020. Um, Florida is considering the elimination of advance registration for um, absentee voting for multiple elections. Um, some states require you to request an absentee ballot for each election. Florida is a state where you can do that for multiple elections um, simultaneously and not have to do it again. Um, Arizona actually has a permanent um, early vote list, which is essentially a, a list that allows you to automatically receive an absentee ballot. You're sort of sick you know, is telling the state, I want to vote absentee um, from here on out. And most people in Arizona cast their ballots by mail. Um, the state has considered, but apparently has rejected 
um, legislation that would purge that list, where if you didn't vote in a certain number of elections, you would be kicked off of the permanent um, early vote list. But I understand there's still a bill pending that would require people to notarize um, their absentee ballots, which is um, pretty restrictive when you, when you, when you, when you think about it. Um, and then I'm sure we're going to talk about um, Georgia um, since we have, because we have Senator um, Oreck here with us, but um, I'm sure folks have read about the range of restrictions that are being considered in Georgia, including the elimination of no excuse absentee voting and um, identification requirements for both um, requesting and then returning um, an absentee ballot. So um, what I think we're seeing broadly here in 2020 uh, or in the post-2020 environment is very similar to what we saw in the post-2008 um, environment. Um, high levels of participation by voters of color and then a direct attack on the means of participation um, that those voters used. Yeah, thanks. That was, uh, it was great. And uh, when I'm going to come back to you about the last 10 year trends uh, shortly. Uh, but let's go to Nan, uh, uh, Senator Nan Orak. Uh, Georgia elections were interesting in 2020 to uh, make the under, uh, pretty much the understatement of the century. Um, <laughs> but one remarkable event was that uh, Republican election officials like Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger uh, standing up, stood up fairly courageously, I think, to President Trump's efforts to undermine the election. But it, it seems like that was like a momentary thing that uh, now we're going back to efforts in Georgia to restrict the vote, as Dale said, particularly of, uh, of African-Americans. So why don't you as a kind of close in observer of what's going on in Georgia, uh, fill us in on what is happening in Georgia today around elections. Uh, thank you, Miles. And uh, boy, what great remarks we've heard uh, from our uh, earlier presenters. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, this, 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 this trend uh, has a, a long and, and dark history. And of course, we all know the battles that were fought and the people that were wounded and died. And uh, as Dr. Uh, Reverend Lowry, uh, Joseph Lowry used to say, you know, we bled too profusely, marched too long to, uh, and lost too many lives to stand by and let them uh, reverse our access to the ballot. And um, in 2005, Georgia became, and the experts correct me if I'm wrong, but to my knowledge, the first state in the union to pass voter ID legislation. Um, we did walkouts, we did uh, uh, talk-ins, we brought manacles to the well of the Senate uh, to stop that, uh, those, that draconian voter ID, and we saw it spread like a virus throughout the nation. And sometimes they caught them red-handed uh, when that Pennsylvania uh, Republican leader said, well, we passed that voter ID bill and now we're gonna win all our elections or, or whatever, I, I'm misquoting, paraphrasing. But it became increasingly clear, this wasn't about voter ID, this wasn't about cleaning up the voting process, it was about blocking access and just like the poll tax was. So uh, down here in Dixieland, you know, the shadow of the plantation casts uh, a, a long shadow over uh, the century and a half. So that was put in in 2005. And then as you described, uh, Dale, we saw uh, in the uh, late aughts that there was a, the rec there was a recognition or, uh, by the Republicans that wait, we can get out our vote uh, by uh, absentee ballot. And they, they uh, put this very, very uh, open uh, ended process in where you can vote by mail and do early voting and um, not have to have you know, without without an excuse or without a being ill or, or being old or, or whatever, they they uh, really uh, opened up access to early voting and uh, absentee ballot casting. Uh, there was a change of heart uh, in this uh, decade that we just uh, completed, and that was when our uh, current governor Brian Kemp was the Secretary of State for about eight years, and in in that period. Uh, he, the ACLU had to just sue him and, uh, and the other voting rights groups over and over. He was in court. He was the one that introduced exact match signatures uh, here where, or exact match names where if you had a, anywhere any ID existing that had uh, a wrong middle name or was the name identical to someone else's, uh, they, were, they were purging the rolls uh, by the hundreds of thousands. Uh, and, uh, and when the courts would 
get an agreement with them. No, don't do this anymore. Okay, we'll agree to that. Then they would come back over here to the legislature, the Secretary of State, and get a bill passed to allow him to do it. Uh, so that, um, and, and at the same time, what was happening is that we were building up the infrastructure of the advocacy community uh, uh, to get out here and get people registered, educated, turn out, uh, and, and, and our numbers were going up of the people registered and the people engaged in the, in the uh, electoral process. Now today, an early count, maybe a week ago, I had 30 bills that have been introduced on voting uh, in Georgia. And we've only been in session for <laughs> scarcely over a month. We went in the, the, you know, the second Monday in January and here, here we are, we've passed Valentine's Day and headed towards St. Patrick's Day and the bills keep flying. And today one was introduced known as uh, the omnibus bill to um, in a house. And as I was telling uh, my panelists, 50, 50 page bill, uh, and the people that are on the committee got it maybe 45 minutes before the meeting. Uh, and it is, uh, as, Wendy, as Wendy pointed out to me, Sunday early voting would be eliminated. The souls to the polls that has been so successful. We live in a state with a growing uh, minority population. Georgia is about 33% African-American uh, and uh, a growing, a growing Hispanic vote, uh, the Asian American vote soared in terms of the turnout of that population here uh, in our historic 2018 elections uh, when the governor's race was, uh, Stacey Abrams was challenging the Secretary of State Kemp uh, for, for the governorship and, and narrowly lost that. So now we're in the battles uh, to we're trying to lessen barriers, we in the Democratic caucus that I'm a member of, whereas the GOP that, that uh, runs the state at this point uh, continues to create uh, barriers, introduce bills to create barriers. And um, they're, they're, as, as you can imagine, there are 30 of them. Uh, another, and a, there's another omnibus that's threatening to come in the, on the Senate side. So uh, the, and, and they have early morning meetings, seven o'clock meetings to vote these bills out in the last two days in the Senate uh, and didn't live stream it, didn't allow anybody any access and brought the bills up in the big committee uh, today for votes and um, wouldn't allow any witnesses because they said we had those witnesses, whoever wanted to could have come out at seven o'clock on Monday morning uh, or on Tuesday morning and uh, had a fine old time. So we are, the battle is joined here in, in Georgia. Massive uh, turnout rates uh, in, in the uh, November 20 election uh, um, we've got 7.6 million people registered to vote in Georgia and uh, the uh, voter registration efforts go on year round here. Um, we, we it, it's just accurate to say we don't have the votes to defeat these bills in the main. Um, and the um, Next year we have a uh, 2022. We have our governor's race again. Stacey Abrams will be up against the former Secretary of State, and we have, as Miles, as you pointed out, this incredible uh, Georgia be becoming the uh, uh, epicenter of the political universe uh, uh, as we moved into this uh, election for two Senate seats, which is a rare bird. Uh, and those early January elections put two Democrats in. Uh, in, in, in the Senate that made the Senate 50-50. So uh, it, it, it uh, no, no rest for the weary, as they say. We're not, we have not sat back and drawn a deep breath and, uh, and uh, laid down for a nap, but we're, we're back on the battlefield uh, fighting and, and educating the voters, educating the people of Georgia about the efforts to turn back the clock and uh, uh, hollow out uh, democracy by with these bad bills. All right. Well, we'll be following along with you to see how this uh, how this all turns out. Uh, I'm mindful of time, and I want to remind people: if you want to have ask a question, please go to the Q and A uh, section down. I see uh, some questions there, but there's room for more. Uh, Wendy, let me come back to you. Uh, Dale was Dale did us a kind of good historical favor of going back to 2008 and 2010 and what happened. Um, 
I know you have been tracking, you've been in NCSL for 10 years and you've been tracking election changes since then. What do you, what's your, what, what, I've actually made the case that, you know, that there has been a lot of good progress as well as voter suppression efforts uh, over the last 10 years and that that has had some impact on turnout. But, but what do you see? I, I bow to your expertise in the matter. Well, thank you, Miles. And, and I did bring a slide, so I'm gonna pop that up now if I may. Um, Let's sure. see how quickly I can get this up for you. Um, and instead of doing like Dale did of using 2008, um, I started in the year 2000. And I looked at what kinds of policies have changed since then. And I just think that the historical perspective is good. 2008 is a great starting point. 2000 is good. I think going back to 1950 would be good as well. But here's what I've got for you. On voter ID um, in 2000, uh, 13 states asked for a um, physical ID and Senator Oreck, that you were right about Georgia. These are mostly states that requested it, but didn't require it. So Georgia was the first out, out of the um, uh, deck to uh, require it. And now 34 states ask for some kind of a physical ID. And there's different levels of strictness amongst these. But I will say that the conversation about voter ID is much quieter now than it was five years ago or eight years ago. Right. Although right now, and, and uh, you both pointed it out, the combination of where do voter ID and no excuse absentee voting or mail voting, where do they uh, come together is kind of a hot topic. Um, in 2000, hardly uh, no one had um, online voter registration. We were just very, very um, new at having the internet available to us. And now 40 states have that. Election day went from six to 21. Uh, those are just two markers. We could look at automatic voter registration, which of course also didn't start then. Um, but my, my idea is that I'm not sure that registration does increase turnout, but it is certainly something that uh, it's a gateway to voting. So uh, these efforts to um, uh, make more options for how people can register have been increasing. And then I've got the numbers for the states that had early in-person voting and no excuse absentee voting then and now. And then on the all mail voting, we um, only one state, Oregon, had it in 2000, and now five states have it. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if we're at six or seven at the end of this year. California, in particular, looks like it might be ripe for going in that direction uh, this year. It did it last year on a temporary basis, and whether it does it on a permanent basis is uh, yet to be seen. So I guess the overall, uh, you could say that all states are making more efforts to clarify whatever it is they want because there's more laws on the books for all of these things. Uh, but so, some of this is um, uh, making the process maybe uh, easier to for the voter. And I'm thinking, Miles, about a bill I know you care about. It's that universal voting um, uh, bill that's uh, live in Connecticut. You know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. We don't have to just stick with these. These are just a few that I thought might help us to frame this as a 20 year process instead of what happened between 20 and 21, what happened from 2000 to now? Yes. Great, thanks. That's a really uh, great slide and an interesting perspective. Do you wanna add anything further to that, Wendy? I'm good. I bet Dale will have something to say. All right. Uh, Dale, actually I have a question that occurred to me uh, and that is that you, know, you do a lot of business, the ASLU does a lot of business in courts and my sense in 2020 uh, was that overall, the courts held the, you know, the courts did their job and over, generally speaking, protected uh, voters more than, uh, but at the same time, you've got uh, an efforts to, you know, make the courts more conservative. Back when Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump were talking to each other, they were working together to, uh, you know, st uh, stop the courts. What do you think is the real, uh, impact. What are we likely to see in the courts as the as the 2021 legislation goes through? And I guess you could add, what are we going to see from a very different Justice Department that we're going to have? I mean, it's hard to predict in advance. We don't know which of these bills are going to pass and what they're going to look like finally and what litigation might look like. I, I will say that the courts did very well um, and judges appointed by presidents of, you know, both political parties, I think, you know, held the line really against the kind of very baseless, you know, fact-free complaints that the Trump campaign was bringing to try to overturn elections results. And, you know, viewed strictly from that lens, I think the courts really did a, a, a great job, better than a lot of our other um, governmental institutions in, 
you know, um, standing up for basic principles of uh, democracy and not allowing sort of like lies and innuendo and very kind of, you know, uh, I would say specious legal theories to undermine the results of a free and fair election and maybe the cl most closely scrutinized election that we've um, had ever and certainly in, in recent years. Um, I will say though, starting from the beginning, like I would think that's a pretty low bar, right? Like I would, I would expect the courts to do that. And what the courts, what the courts didn't do much of last year, I think was respond to um, real concerns that we raised in a number of lawsuits um, that others ha did as well about the threat to voting rights that um, trying to conduct an election under normal rules um, um, would, would have in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, right? A lot of rules that we have that normally are not particularly burdensome, maybe they stop a few people from voting, um, um, requirements to get a witness to sign your absentee ballot, notarizing your absentee ballot, things like that. So, so some people stop, don't, don't vote because of the, these rules, but probably in a normal election, not all that many. When you have the worst respiratory pandemic in a century and people are being told to stay home, well, you know, restrictions like that take on a whole different character. Um, you know, challenges to those kinds of laws had, I would say, mixed success. And even where such challenges were initially successful in trial courts, um, they were often stayed um, on appeal. And Courts didn't do as much, I think, to protect um, people's right to vote in the very, very particular circumstances of the pandemic um, as I would have hoped um, when the pandemic began 10 or 11 um, months ago. And what about, any, any, any thoughts about what we're likely to see this year? Uh, well, I, hard, again, hard to say, because I don't know what these laws are eventually gonna look like and we'll see what the legislative records turn up in terms of what um, these legislators are actually considering. Um, I, I will say this, though, you get to your question about the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice could hardly do worse than it did over the last four years. I think the administration filed a single voting right case under the Voting Rights Act uh, over the last four years, um, which, you know, I can't, I don't think there's ever been a four year period um, with the DOJ doing so little to enforce the, the VRA. Right. Okay, Tov, I'm gonna to come over to you. Uh, I know you've been monitoring, uh, uh, well, you've been monitoring the election system for years, I know that, but also monitoring the, uh, the, the Q&A. So do you wanna sort of lead us off with a question from the audience? Yeah, I was just gonna say also that um, Georgia and Florida make me feel quite secure that you, Dale and I are not going out of business anytime soon. Um, can always count on them. So um, yeah, so a lot of people are asking questions that are similar to the one that you just asked, Miles, and I'll put it a different way. Um, Dale, I know that you're saying that you don't know exactly what these bills are gonna look like in these states, so it's hard to really assess where the litigation is gonna be, but maybe I would ask it as what types of measures do you think will be actionable and challengeable? Like, I know, so in the past, there has been litigation when there have been cutbacks to early voting and elimination of Sunday voting. Um, you know, which is blatant, right? Um, I don't know that there's ever been anything about cutting that vote by mail because I never wanted to do that before. But I, so what are the kinds of things that seem like that could be good lawsuits? Uh, you know, it's, again, it's I think kind of hard to say until we actually see it, but you know, the kinds of things that have been um, ruled invalid by courts in recent years are things like Texas's very restrictive voter identification requirement, which, you know, I think that ruling was very specific to the facts of Texas. In Texas, it's particularly difficult to obtain ID if you don't already have it, um, particularly if you're of lesser means. I mean, there are, you know, um, I think over 70 counties in Texas that don't even have ID issuing offices. And Texas is a very big state geographically. So if you don't have a, a driver's license, um, you know, to get to a, an ID issuing office in another county is quite difficult because you can't drive there because you don't have a license, right? So, um, you know, a, a really, really restrictive requirement like that where there are very, very significant practical barriers that completely prevent certain people from being able to 
have the requisite documentation or whatever that could be actionable. North Carolina had a bill that was ruled intentionally discriminatory and struck down as unconstitutional in the 2016 election cycle. And I think what was particularly unique about that bill was the breadth of it. It wasn't just an ID requirement, but it also cut early voting. It also got rid of same day registration. It also got rid of pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds. It also required ballots cast at the wrong precinct to be discarded in their entirety instead of um, being partially counted for offices which the voter was in fact eligible to vote for like you know senator or governor or president. Um, so it's kind of I think the sweeping breadth of it and that every one of these things um, disproportionately hit black voters in the state that was ultimately persuasive to the court there. You know if you get a provision you know a bill like these kind of omnibus bills that are being proposed in Georgia or Iowa um, to pass then you know, it's possible you could see litigation like the North Carolina litigation from four and a half years ago. Um, if you get more targeted um, restrictions that just kind of make voting a little bit harder, narrow the window in which you can request an absentee ballot without making it altogether impossible for someone to cast one, I think those are the kinds of restrictions that will be more difficult to challenge in court. What about specifically cutting out Sunday voting as being racially discriminatory, which I think Nam thinks is the case. <laughs> it's kind of hard to see what the rationale for that is when, yeah. you know, it's been administered, I think, in Georgia for decades at this point. You know, uh, a court in Florida in 2012 found that that would have a racially discriminatory impact without going into um, the motives of the legislature there. Now, that was also under a provision of the Voting Rights Act that is no longer operative, Section 5, the preclearance provision. So, um, again, I, I, you know, I, I like to be kind of lowercase c conservative in the way that I predict, you know, what courts will or won't do. And, you know, I, I try not to be a crystal ball here. Um, I don't know what courts will do, but um, the elimination of Sunday voting seems kind of like a red flag to me. Yeah, um, me too. Um, when you, um, one thing I don't think I heard you bring up, and maybe not any of you, uh, though who knows what, what is on the docket, but um, it's the purge issue um, and the issue of um, purges as another big thing that has come up. And on the voter ID issue also, how much do you think it's that they've moved on to other things as opposed to all the places that were gonna pass ID laws have already done it? I think you're muted, Wendy. Wendy, you're muted. Okay, um, I, I think you're probably right that the the number of states that have um, a voter ID laws is is about as high as it's likely to go given the political landscape. So uh, that was a conversation that took place. Most states have have gotten to where they need to be. That doesn't mean that there aren't Republican-led states that don't have it, and Democratic states I might have to think about that that, that uh, do have it. But but I think that issue, other than the way that it dovetails with absentee voting is primarily, again, fine tuning. Do we wanna add a kind of ID to the list? Do we wanna remove a kind of ID to the list? It's mostly fine tuning other than whether we should need to do something different with um, uh, absentee ballots. And then your other question was about list purging and, and um, of course we would call it list maintenance where, where I live. Um, and every state has the floor set by the National Voter Registration Act on, on how they do it and how they enact that can be a little bit different, but uh, there is protections there against last minute purging. Um, and there's a couple of variations on, on how to do it. And we do see some laws on that. But one I would offer to anyone who is thinking about wanting to have really clean lists is one way to do that is to look at the Electronic Registration Information Center known as ERIC. So that's a consortium amongst the states where they can compare uh, the voter list. So if there's a Wendy Underhill in Kansas and a Wendy Underhill in Colorado, it doesn't kick what that, either of those Wendy Underhills off of the list, but it does call to the attention of both Kansas and Colorado that there could be a duplication. And then both states can um, explore does she still live there or not? So it's a, a way to clean the list that I think has um, attraction for both parties. And uh, it's certainly been growing. I think we're at 30 states now. So in the other 20, if you're thinking about uh, list maintenance, making sure your rolls are as clean as they can be by the time you start to get people to the polls or send out ballots, that's an option to consider. 
When did you see Jova, it? Jova, let me jump, jump in for a second and just ask Nan to follow up on that. Because I think Georgia, uh, as I've followed it over the years, has just been like a whirlwind of uh, argument and back and forth over the purging issue. Um, you know, the exact match um, issue. Uh, I know that uh, there were 53,000 voters who were held back because they uh, might. Uh, I think I saw a statistic a few years ago that more people were purged than actually were registered over a two or three year period. What's the what's the status and how how well do you think the the the, the fight against unfair purging uh, has gone and is going in Georgia? You're muted, Nan. On board. Each, uh, it's death by a thousand cuts. Uh, and Dale was describing a kind of small, narrow, targeted, we're going to change this, we're going to change that, we're going to change this. Um, and, and when you're running race, when you're, when the races are being won by razor thin margins, being decided with a razor thin margin, it really does. It really does. Uh, if you, you put enough of those together and you have drawn blood, you know, you've, you've uh, uh, put the stake in the heart. Uh, and, uh, and, and so they, these bills are not cleaning that up. And um, it's very interesting. Our, our secretary of state, as Miles pointed out, you know, uh, had the courage to stand up against uh, the abusive uh, efforts of Trump to get in here and uh, uh, dominate the situation and, and and pressure election officials, Republican election officials, up to all the way up to the governor to change the outcome of the vote in Georgia. I mean, you, that's forgotten national public national publicity over and over. Uh, but he now now that the elections are coming up, the next elections, the Republicans that don't really claim that Trump won here or that there was a miscount they they instead say we've got to make we've got to modernize our system so that people have confidence again in our elections uh and then they and 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 in, do, in doing that they start with these whacking away at uh, uh bit by bit by bit no vote on sunday less than the, that that move move uh uh you know reduce the window in which you can request an absentee ballot uh that is almost surely uh, going to pass. And I would point out another dynamic that's at play here in Georgia. And that is that they attack and, and pursue legal and uh, 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 legal attacks against the nonprofit groups, the voter registration, voter rights organizations that are out here mobilizing and activating. Now, Wendy, Wendy pointed out that uh, the findings in recent years are that everybody that you go out there and finally get to register, you know, get them to come out and, and do that, do the deal. Uh, that doesn't mean they show up on on the on voting day. You have another whole entire challenge to keep those people engaged and go back to them and and uh, and get them out casting a vote by by one method or another. Uh, so the work of those groups is very, very important. And what the, the group that Stacey Abrams formed here and that was chaired by Reverend Warnock, who is now in the U.S. Senate, uh, uh, New Georgia Project, is being um, uh, demeaned, uh, accusations being made in the press by the state the elections board that's dominated by, by Republicans, uh, investigations launched. And this is, this is really old hat here in Georgia. The... Um, because you do that to weaken the capacity of the organizations to get out here and do the job that they're pledged to do. That's their mission, which is to, uh, 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 you know, identify uh, the uh, unregistered, uh, reg get them registered, and then work with them all year so that they turn out on election day. Uh, and that capacity is is uh, sharply eroded when you've got to got to be paying lawyers and showing up in court and fighting the battle in the media. Uh, all that's been launched since the, the, the January 5th election. Uh, just to tell you how, how big the stakes are in 2022, it's our, all our statewide officers. Trump has said he's gonna come in and, can, and personally take down uh, our governor because the governor would not cave to him. Uh, Raffensperger is uh, some call him 
you know, an endangered species that that that, that for his winning, that the Secretary of State winning after standing up against Trump and our in our state is going to be impossible. And I can't measure, but I can't quantify it, but it's definitely there. And that is the alternative that the alternative narrative, if they want to block us from voting, if they want to make it that hard, we're going to vote no matter what. There's, there's that impact. But then there are others who say, I'm not going to go down there to my precinct and get embarrassed and get my vote challenged and give him some bogus provisional ballot to, to uh, fill out instead of a, 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 a true ballot that I'm casting. So it, it, it cuts all kinds of ways. Uh, and uh, the the uh, the electoral, I mean the 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 the, the court battles that that are being fought uh, are critically important. And Miles, back back to the one of what's going to happen with with uh, the uh, it's it's unresolved about their being able to get out here and whack away uh, at the in, in these purges. They've been doing it now in abundance for some years, and we all know what a uh, what a blow it was to democracy for uh, the courts to uh, erode the uh, Voting Rights Act. And so the, the um, I guess it's House Bill 1, House Bill 1, the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act, uh, to restore that, that bill to its former potency and give us back protections uh, as, we, uh, as we move forward facing reapportionment is, is tremendously important to, uh, to, to, to get those guardrails reestablished that so many fought and died for and that were in the law for years and uh, need, need to be restored. Yeah, actually there were a few questions in the chat. I was gonna to get to that about HR1, which is different than the, then there's the John Lewis bill and SB1, which if you haven't seen, you know, just really um, go across the board and all the kinds of voting reforms you might wanna to see to make voting uh, more accessible for everybody. Um, so if anyone else wants to say anything about that, but I also just wanted to follow up and ask, the efforts to restrict voting by mail, which um, is the new thing, right, this year that I think we're seeing a lot of. I, Wendy, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it? Could you repeat that? The t uh, because I, the phone rang and. Yeah, no, that, so it, the efforts to restrict vote by mail that are suddenly the new thing this year and, you know, hadn't really come up in this way before um, is a little bit strange considering the approach to vote by mail in the past. And also possibly uh, might come back to bite them politically. If they're right. I don't. So my thing is, and I'm, I'm trying to look at this, is whether the thing, the way people voted during the pandemic, is going to be the same. So they're all going to say, "Oh, I love voting by mail. I'm going to vote by mail forever," or they're going to revert back to pretty much the same patterns or closer to the same patterns as before. Um, as we know, African American voters had historically um, voted in person at much higher rates. Um, the white people, and then the reverse was true. Whites voted much more at vote by mail. So I don't know how any of you see that playing out. I guess I'll offer that in fact, last year, it was partly the decisions that election administrators um, all the way up to governors and legislators made on what was available to voters. But more than that, it was the choice of the voters to make use of already existing options that they just hadn't um, accessed previously. So there were some changes that were just temporary. Um, and there was that the kind of thing where you mail out an absentee ballot application was kind of a 2020 novelty. Uh, and, and as um, Dale pointed out, at least in Iowa, uh, there's a bill to not permit that. But voters have choice already. And um, whether they stay with what they got, did they like their experience or not? Um, I guess I don't know how to know that yet. Well, you know, Wendy, if I could, um, it's interesting because the the governors of uh, seat are are divided on that question uh, of uh, doing away with um, no excuse absentee voting. They're not the top leadership are are not all on one page, and that's 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 based on knowing that people have really utilized and embraced uh, voting by mail, and 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 could resent no matter what party they're in the fact that that access uh, is now denied to them. So that that the that outcome on that question here is all wrapped up in the uh, politics uh, of the of the 
the state in this current setting. And of course, uh, we just uh, heard that it was announced that a s former Senator Perdue, who was defeated in the uh, runoff elections at, uh, from his seat in the um, US Senate, has filed papers to run next year against uh, Reverend Warnock to secure the Senate seat um, that will be on the ballot then. So uh, it'll be the clash of the titans in Georgia. And we appreciated all of the, all of the engagement from around the country uh, in, in, in working to defend democracy here. We, yeah, you know, um, and that was actually one of the questions, well, actually from a couple of people is how can we help you <laughs> from outside? Um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not sure what the strategy is on that. Um, and I just wanted to leave open and I include Miles in this, if anyone wanted to say anything about HR1 or SB1 or the John Lewis Act and whether, um, what the prospects are, but also, because a lot of people asked about it, um, having national standards is actually preferable um, in general. And then Miles, I know, I think we need to go back for, Anything closing the, the panelists want to say? Anybody want to comment on uh, HR1 or SB1? Dale does. I could just see it in his eyes. <laughs> That's right. Go ahead, Dale. I mean, these are huge bills with lots, lots, lots of stuff in them. And yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll just say that, you know, there are some, there are a few provisions that would, I think, effectively moot a lot of issues that. Um, get talked about as, you know, concerns about voter suppression, you know, election day registration, for example, um, you know, that's something that, you know, is actually has, uh, has a much longer vintage in this country than automatic registration, which a lot of folks have been talking about, right? A lot of states adopted election day registration in the 1970s. These are states across the, so, you know, kind of red blue spectrum, right? You have some very red states with election day registration, some blue states, a few you know, purple ones in between. Um, voters who have access to it like it. Um, young voters in particular don't understand why they would need to like print out a piece of paper and find a stamp and mail it somewhere, you know, three or four weeks before an election in order to vote. They're used to, you know, prime now, right? Prime yesterday. Um, so it's just a kind of reform that makes a lot of sense. And to the extent that we're worried about things like erroneous voter purges, right? Um, voters getting knocked off the rolls. Election day registration gives people a chance to fix it. You're worried about like exact match systems where someone, you know, tries to register, but because there's a discrepancy between their registration form and their DMV records, again, election day registration allows you to fix that. Automatic registration too, I think deals with concerns that folks on the more conservative end of the spectrum have about out of date voter rolls, people being on there when they've moved. Automatic registration kind of um, fixes that automatically so that you don't have people um, 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 as, quote, dead wood on the rolls who, um, you know, whose information may no longer be um, totally accurate. So there are, I think, just important pieces in HR1 that um, would moot a lot of the, both the voter suppression and the so-called voter fraud uh, concerns and bring our election administration system up into the 21st century. I mean, it's only 2021 now, so we've had 21 years to get into the 21st century. I think we, we ought to be able to do it. Uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, you know, needless to say, I think uh, HR1 and SB1 and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, um, you know, these are all gonna be major discussions um, in Congress and we will uh, absolutely, you know, have events that are about them uh, as, as it moves along. And the other thing that's obvious is that, you know, as the legislative session, some of the session, some states uh, are in session all year long, but most of the states, uh, their legislative sessions will be finished by May or June. So we'll return to this at that point and just see, we'll have a much better sense of how all this has played out. Uh, right now, all we're seeing is the opening acts of a, of a, of a, dra of a several month drama uh, at the state level, but we'll uh, whether we have you back or 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 some of your colleagues in the movement, we'll uh, we'll return to these issues for sure. So let me before I, I want to make announcements about a couple of events. Tova, thank you very much for your monitoring uh, uh, work. But as as I promised, I want to give all three of you a chance to make any um, last remarks that you want to make, something you want to leave us with. And Nan, let's start with you. Well, I would. Uh... I, I would say that we have seen in our state uh, the uh, the, out, the outcome of the of the 
January uh, vote for the Senate seats uh, is not an isolated uh, outcome. Uh, lovers of democracy have been investing for, um, mm, I, 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 I want to say uh, almost 20 years, but have been building, putting together pieces of infrastructure. Uh, philanthropy has been an important part of that. Um, uh, to, to get uh, nonprofit efforts that are not uh, nonpartisan efforts out here to engage with with the uh, population to get out here and and uh, get connected in as voters and um, and also to coordinate those efforts so that everybody's not over in silos uh, you know going going to the to, to the same areas uh, trying to register voters and and missing other areas so there's been this there's been broad investment in de in developing infrastructure in our state um, to mobilize people to vote and it's been nonpartisan and that has been a very significant piece of this and of course the parties uh, get out here and and outreach to their voters and, and seek new voters, but that that has been uh, an element I, I, that that is new to the stage in Georgia over the last ten to fifteen years, uh, and it's been it's been a real plus plus and very positive. And those nonprofits worked across the state uh, to uh, spur turnout, uh, not advocating for a candidate, but advocating to get out here and have a voice in your. Uh, government and in democracy. And that has been, uh, I, I, you just can't understate how important uh, that uh, a role that has that has been played by that that sector, uh, in addition to the, the usual cast of characters, uh, candidates and the uh, political parties, you know, that tee up uh, for uh, these uh, clashes uh, at the ballot box. Well, there'll be lots and lots of uh, eyes on Georgia for the next two years, for sure. And I think going back to Tova's question about how you can help uh, is to help build that infrastructure, for sure. Uh, exactly. Dale, your uh, last thoughts for the audience? Sure. Um, and here I'll steal an idea that um, you know is at the center of um, a, 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 a professor at the Kennedy School, Alex, Alex Kazar's book, The Right to Vote, that the story of the right to vote in this country has never been a simple one of sort of progressive expansion, nor is it a simple one of voter suppression. It's, it's both those things. And sometimes it's those things, not just sequentially, but simultaneously. You know, I, you know one of the um, things that I think about sometimes is the fact that we're told this narrative that like the right to vote has kind of progressively expanded in our nation's history. And that's true, but it hasn't been linear and it hasn't been, um, um, unidirectional, you know, at the founding, um, there were states where, you know, uh, we're sometimes told, like at the founding, only white men who owned property could vote, right? Not entirely true. Um, New Jersey, women who met the property requirement could vote. Um, black men who met property requirements could vote in a number of states, including in North Carolina, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. That's a state that had chattel slavery, and yet black men who met the property requirement could vote at the same time. The 1835 Constitution of North Carolina did away with that. In the wake of Nat Turner's rebellion, the, the North Carolina responded by getting rid of voting rights for black men. But at the same time, they did that. They loosened the property requirements for voting for white men. You had an expansion of voting rights for some people and an altogether elimination of it for others. And when you look at today, 2021, you see this wave of laws that are trying to restrict voting rights. And yet you have more states than ever with election day registration. You have a tax on absentee voting, but you have in Alabama legislation that really has legs to make no excuse absentee voting um, permanent in that state. And it has the support of the very conservative Alabama Secretary of State, um, John Merrill, who's someone who's been an adversary for the ACLU in a number of times. So what does that tell you? That just that the right to vote is, 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 is the story of the right to vote in 2021, as it has been throughout American history is a complicated one. Every story of progress has a story of retrenchment and, and we're, we're seeing both things at the same time. Uh, Dale, thanks. And by the way, Alex, Alex wanted to make sure I said hello to you before. So I, I, I've been negligent up until now, but hi. Uh, Wendy, and you get, the, you get the last word. All right. Um, I'm thinking that what we could think about is what can we support? I mean, there's a lot of attention to what might uh, 
people on the line oppose, but let's think about what we can support. And one thing is we can support our poll workers and our election officials. Those folks came out and did a fabulous job in 2020 and they didn't get nearly enough uh, credit. And uh, if we could just uh, you know, give a pat on the back to everyone who helped serve to make that election work and figure out what their needs are to support them in the future. Uh, likewise, if we could support election infrastructure and funding, uh, whether that's funding from the federal level or state level or county level, uh, note that this is a foundational piece of democracy and, and somehow government needs to pay for this. And then support verifiability. That's not... Um, this would be the post-election audits, and this would be the transparency on allowing people to watch uh, logic and accuracy testing and, and anything else. So supporting verifiability with in paper ballots and such things is something that we can probably all agree would be a good thing. And then Adele, you gave us a, a great hint. My last comment was gonna be, keep your eye on the long-term, which you're obviously doing. So that's that's what I've got, Miles. Great. Well, listen, the three of you have been uh, fabulous and. Uh, Really, really happy for you to uh, be with us here in the Ash community. Let me just make two quick announcements uh, about future events. Uh, tomorrow, uh, the Ash Center will be hosting an event on Myanmar after the coup, uh, oh. moderated by Ash Professor Tarek Masood, uh, featuring people who have been diplomatically placed there. Uh, I think it'll be great. And then our next American Democracy event will be on March 4th and will be a discussion of the use of ballot initiatives by citizens to bring about election reforms. And we'll have some of the real um, successful organizers of ballot initiatives uh, for over the last few years. All right, well, listen, I hope you found uh, today useful. As we said, uh, it, the video will be up on the YouTube channel. Uh, we'll look through the chats and see if there are things that we ought to get back to you about in any way. Uh, so please join us for future events, sign up at the ASH website and thank you all for joining us. And by the way, stay.